So please join me in welcoming our speakers. Well, thank you, Denise, and good morning, everyone. Um, it's really, uh, it's great to be here. Um, it's great to be back on this side of the river again. I've been uh, uh, over at AUVSI now for a little, almost four months. And um, obviously, I joined at a very interesting time. Uh, AUVSI, for those, how many of, of you have heard of AUVSI, just out of curiosity? Oh, fantastic. Um, then you'll know that, that um, a, a couple things about the community that I represent. First and foremost, um, w although I'm a pilot myself, we, we don't just do things that fly. We do thing, unmanned vehicles uh, on the ground, robotics, uh, driverless cars, and just for fun we do things that, uh, that swim and float as well. So it's all three domains. Uh, and. Uh, and it's, there's a, a, a lot of different technologies involved. And I think what's interesting about the community uh, that, that is, is come, has come together over the last 40 plus years to work uh, under the AUVSI umbrella uh, is that there, there are, there's a lot of cross currents in these technologies, but each one of the domains is regulated by a different regulator. So I'm not sure if I'm actually uh, engaged in one uh, advocacy campaign right now or three. Uh, and there may be more as we go forward, uh, given uh, all the state activities as well. But obviously, we're going to talk about uh, unmanned aerial systems today. And, um, and, and as Denise indicated, there is some challenges around nomenclature in this particular arena. Um, I actually have a T-shirt that, that the staff gave me that says, there's nothing unmanned about an unmanned system. So I'm scratching my head in Europe and in Ikea, we call it remotely piloted, et cetera, et cetera. And we were even, I actually walked in on a, on a rebranding exercise for the organization. And, uh, and I think it was one of those classic cases of, you know, it, it hurts so, it feels so good when we stop banging our head against the wall. So let's just leave the brand the way it is. And we'll come back to that, that whole business about what we call this later. Um, that said, it, there's a great deal going on, uh, as you all know. Uh, from my perspective, obviously, the most, the most salient thing is what's happening. Uh, my colleagues at the FAA are in the process of, of now looking at, I, I think, 4,000-odd comments uh, that have come in on the notice of proposed rulemaking for small UAS. That's anything under five, sorry, 55 pounds. Um, and obviously, uh, our community also communicated through AUVSI a, a number of things, and I can come back to that. Um, but I, I wanted to start by just kind of level setting that, that not only are there challenges around nomenclature in this particular arena, uh, but there are lots and lots of different platforms and many, many different applications for, for UAS. So, um, so part of what we are, are looking at is uh, is kind of taking this bite size in, in bite sized pieces, what I hope will be bite sized pieces, uh, but working on different things in parallel so that we, we can take advantage of the enormous economic opportunity that is before us in embracing this technology. And the organization scoped that, op that opportunity with a forecast that was released in 2013, uh, which indicated that from the day we can fly, uh, and not just by exemption, but we can fly under uh, rules. We will create in our community alone uh, over uh, $83 billion in economic activity in the first 10 years and create 103,000 new jobs. Uh, there's additional economic benefit, of course, associated with how this technology is going to be used in a whole variety uh, of industries. Uh, some of the applications Denise already pointed at, but you know, the, if we just look at oil and gas, inspecting high voltage lines um, all the way on through to package delivery, et cetera. Uh, there's just a, a tremendous amount of, of, of economic opportunity. And even my colleagues in the aviation world, um, I was on a, a panel down at Sun and Fun, and it was very sunny down there, and there was a lot of fun going on. Uh, but Congressman Graves held a, a town hall meeting, and I was there with Mark Baker from Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association 
and Matt Zaccaro from the Helicop Helicopter Association International. Uh, and, and Matt said, you know, we're embracing this technology too. We have, uh, we have lots of missions that we fly with rotorcraft that can be done much more economically uh, with a quadcopter. And so our community increasingly <clears throat> is beginning to look at this as another business tool. And, and why wouldn't they if their customers are saying, gee, we, we really need this done. It's safer to do, do this with, uh, with a device that's actually being controlled from the ground. Uh, and vastly more economical. So, uh, so it, it's almost impossible to anticipate all the different ways that we can utilize UAS going forward, uh, and that's part of the fun of, of, of what we're seeing right now. Uh, we're also seeing that in the enormous number of uh, requests uh, that Rob is getting for exemptions at the FAA. Uh, they've done, I think, a yeoman's job trying to organize that work better, and I'll let him speak to the, the summary grant process that's now underway. Uh, but this is, of course, no way to regulate. We need to get the NPRM finished, at least for the small UAS. That's a top priority for us. Um, and frankly, we think that the FAA has done a good job getting started in that process. Uh, they've taken a risk-based approach. We like risk-based technology neutral uh, regulation, and we're, we're arguing that regulation is extremely important for safe and responsible use. So we like certain elements of the regulation. Uh, our comments pointed at some things that we think can still be done in a low-risk profile uh, that would allow us to collect data and get smarter as we go forward to enable some of the more complex operations. In the rule specifically, we'd like the FAA to consider nighttime operations. We'd like to be able to go beyond visual line of sight for certain things where we can develop and, and demonstrate equivalent levels of safety. Um, we, there are a number of things that, that are included in our comments that we can get into uh, rather than getting, giving you all of the, uh, the details right away. But there's uh, a, a lot that needs to be done, and as we've communicated, uh, whether it's under the, that particular rule or in uh, additional things that we'll be working on in parallel, uh, we would like to see uh, technologies developed that, that allow for us to bring technology solutions forward that frankly we think is gonna make the airspace safer for everyone, uh, including me. Sense and avoid is something that frankly, if you know, given what a blunt instrument uh, see and avoid is, if we can create sense and avoid in an economical way that can be deployed uh, with a form factor that would work on a small drone, then why wouldn't we deploy that on all aircraft? So there's a lot that's going to be created that creates value for end user communities. It's, we're going to stand up a whole new community that's supporting this industry itself, uh, and, and we think that ultimately we're going to develop technologies that are going to make the entire airspace safer for everyone. So I'm delighted to be here, and I'll pass it on to the next gentleman. Thank <clears throat> Thank you, Brian, and uh, thank you, Denise, and the center for uh, having this panel today and for inviting me to participate. Good morning, everybody. If everybody would just in indulge me, I'm going to do a little bit of reading here, uh, just for my opening remarks. I, I promise I won't be, be very long here. Um, I know everyone participating today already realizes the great potential of UAS technology and the wide range of applications. This technology also introduces a number of new risks into our aviation system. As UAS technologies continue to advance at a rapid pace, the challenge is to develop a regulatory framework that facilitates continued innovation while ensuring the safety of other airspace users and people and property on the ground. Since the 2012 FAA Reauthorization Act, we've made a lot of progress and learned a great deal along the way. The FAA put forward a comprehensive plan and a five-year roadmap. We also have a research program that leverages the strengths of our interagency partners and industry to overcome barriers to U.S. integration, such as detect and avoid technologies and standards. The six U.S. test sites we selected in 2013 to aid in U.S. integration are fully operational. The FAA Tech Center in Atlantic City is receiving data from the test sites that will inform key questions such as how unmanned aircraft interface with air traffic control. The last several years have also seen a rise in UAS operations in the NAS. The FAA issued restricted category type certificates to UAS operating in the Arctic. We've issued more than 175 special airworthiness certificates in the experimental category 
more than 30 of which are remain active. These approvals facilitate research and development, crew training, and market surveys. We have issued more than 2,000 public COAs to national, state, and local public operators of UAS for many different operations, including many in the area of public safety. Almost 900 of those are active today. On the civil side, what I'm involved with most closely, we have issued close to 250 exemptions since September under Section 333 of the 2012 Act. Including petitions that have been closed out, we've completed assessments of almost 25 percent of the petitions received. These operations do not pose a risk to others operating the NAS, to the general public, or to national security, and these UAS can be safely operated without an airworthiness certificate. These operators are conducting operations every day, and making movies, inspecting critical infrastructure, marketing real estate, aerial mapping, surveying, inspecting agriculture, improving railroad safety, and many, many other amazing applications. We learned a great deal from the earlier petitions we assessed, and a little more than a month ago, we reviewed the lessons learned and to streamline the exemption process. As a result, the FAA is issuing dozens of additional exemptions on a weekly basis. Doing a little math here, that's a lot of operators currently authorized to fly right now. Section 333 demand remains remarkably high, and we will continue our efforts to review these as quickly as possible. We also proposed a rule that would allow routine use of small unmanned aircraft systems for commercial purposes without an airworthiness certificate or a certificate of waiver authorization. The proposed rule, the small U.S. MPRM, covers many potential small U.S. operations and offers a flexible framework for the safe use of these systems while accommodating future innovation in the industry. As proposed, the United States would have one of the most flexible UAS regulatory frameworks in the world. The public comment period closed on Friday, and approximately 4,500 comments were submitted. As we work to finalize the small UAS rule, we will continue efforts on future UAS integration plans. As UAS operations in the system increase, we are reaching out to educate the public on the safe and responsible use of UAS. The FAA provided model aircraft enthusiast guidance on the do's and don'ts of safe model aircraft operations. We have partnered with members of industry and the modeling community to initiate the Know Before You Fly campaign to promote safe and responsible UAS operations. The FAA is also working to best position law enforcement to detect, deter, detect, investigate, and report unauthorized or unsafe UAS operations. While our first action is to educate UAS operators about compliance, when appropriate, we will use administrative or legal enforcement action. Issuing a final rule for small UAS operations is a top priority for the FAA, but we are already looking beyond that rulemaking to identify additional types of operations and what technologies we need to certify. The FAA has consulted with the UAS Aviation Rulemaking Committee, the ARC, for recommendations for enabling U.S. operations with the greatest benefits. As the industry and system grow more complex, we must ensure that our resources are directed to the areas with the highest safety risk. We will need to expand collaborative, data-driven processes with the U.S. industry to improve safety and streamline certification. The FAA is safely and steadily integrating U.S. into the NAS. And as we do, we continue to look to the future to make sure the proper framework and standards are in place to facilitate the continued safe integration in an increasingly complex airspace system. We look forward to continuing to work with our partners in government and the aviation community and to make steady progress toward that goal. Thank you and I look forward to our discussion today. Thanks, Rob. And maybe I'll just take this opportunity to introduce Jay Stanley from the ACLU. Uh, Jay is a senior policy analyst with the ACLU Speech, Privacy and Technology Project where he researches, writes, and speaks about technology-related privacy and civil liberties issues. Uh, he is the editor of their Free Future blog and has authored a variety of very influential ACLU reports on privacy and technology topics. Uh, before joining the ACLU, he was an analyst at the technology research firm Forrester. He served as uh, an American politics editor of Facts and Files uh, uh, World News Digest and was also uh, National Newswire Editor at MediaLink. And so I wanted to welcome Jay. Look forward to your remarks. 
and occasionally screws up his calendar. Uh, I apologize for being late today. Um, I think I must have been in a different time zone when I put the, today's event on. Um, so uh, the ACLU's primary concern when it comes to drones is that they not be used for mass suspicionless surveillance of uh, U.S. populations. Um, you know, drones are a very powerful, potentially, surveillance technology. Um, there are technologies out there that enable persistent surveillance um, of entire towns, neighborhoods, cities uh, with a single camera, a single ultra high uh, resolution camera. There's a company now called Persistent Surveillance Solutions that operates out of Ohio that uses manned aircraft um, to circle over a uh, town or a city and to uh, constantly videotape in fairly high resolution an entire 25 square mile area any pedestrian or vehicle within that area can be tracked um, retrospectively. So it won't be long before uh, you know, that kind of technology finds its way to drones probably. Um, and you know, that, the kind of tracking that can be done with that kind of technology is a very serious privacy problem. When people know everywhere that you go, they know a lot about you. They know uh, where you work and where you live, but also what friends and lovers you might ha be visiting at what hours. Uh, what kinds of uh, religious, political, sexually oriented establishments or meetings you might be going to, um, and many other things about you. Um, so, uh, you know, that is our primary concern around drones, and we have called for regulation of police and government use of drones uh, to ensure that they don't become used for mass surveillance. Unfortunately, we do have a long record of law enforcement giving in to temptations to collect everything all the time about everybody just in case somebody engages in wrongdoing. We believe that that doesn't, is not consistent with our, um, with our nation's traditions. The government does not look over your shoulder without particularized suspicion that you are doing something wrong. It doesn't watch you just because you might, in theory, do something wrong. Um, so we have called for a set of rules that, that, um, that, that only that restrict law enforcement to launching a drone in particular circumstances where they have reason to believe that it will collect evidence of wrongdoing um, or in emergencies um, or, or for, uh, you know, for other uses that there's no reason to think would invade privacy, such as, um, you know, environmental essays or what have you. Um, and, that the, and that law enforcement be explicit about its policies, its retention policies, that it have good data retention policies, um, and sharing policies and so forth, and that and that it and that local law enforcement um, be subject to local democratic power. And all too often, we see what I call policy making by procurement, in which local law enforcement, um, rather than than um, seeking the permission, let alone uh, I mean informing, let alone getting the permission of local uh, democratic overseers, just goes out and starts buying new surveillance technology and deploying it before anybody even knows that it's on the ground. We've seen this with stingrays, we've seen this with license plate scanners um, and other technologies, which are very sensitive uh, and have a lot of implications for our privacy and, and, the, and the power balance between the individual and society. Um, you can argue either way about how these technologies should be used, but I think we should all be able to agree that we live in a democracy, and those kinds of value judgments should be made democratically and not in secret by law enforcement aggregating to themselves the power to decide where that balance should lie. Um, when it comes to commercial side of drones, we have not called for regulations at this time. It's a much more complicated issue. Number one, drones are a cool technology. They are a generative, te generative technology. We're going to see them used as a platform for all kinds, the full flower of human ingenuity, um, good, bad, and ugly, and everything in between. Um, and uh, it, it, and we, you know, we don't want to hold back. We're a pro-technology organization. We don't want to hold back innovation. Number two, it's not clear what kind of privacy uh, invasions we will see with private sector drones. It's less clear, certainly less clear than the incentives of law enforcement, which, uh, which are very clear. Um, and we don't know the extent to which those privacy uh, invasions that do occur will be covered by existing laws, such as peeping tom laws, trespassing, nuisance laws, et cetera. Um, and finally, the commercial use of drones is complicated by the First Amendment. We at the ACLU are a photographer's rights organization, among many other things. We have uh, engaged in legal actions across the nation, um, defending the rights of photographers, for example, to photograph police. We see 
police come up to people all the time, sir, you need to turn that camera off. Um, but the courts have consistently found that you do have a First Amendment right to record and videotape and photograph things that are in public when you are in public and, and lawfully present and not interfering with legitimate police operations. Um, so uh, I think that our nightmare scenario would be that uh, the government and police use drones for pervasive surveillance and uh, individuals and the private sector and journalists are barred from using drones at all because of security concerns. Um, and uh, you know, we think that uh, the people have a right to photograph their government, but the government shouldn't be tracking or monitoring or photographing uh, individuals without individualized suspicion of wrongdoing. Um, so that's, that's the broad take on the ACLU's view. I guess I could go into detail in lots of different directions, but maybe I'll leave it there and I'll leave it for open discussion. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, so just about everything I was going to say has pretty much already been said, but I'll say, say some of it again with maybe a little bit of a different perspective. Um, talking about the technology, can everybody hear me? I'm not sure if I can, okay. Mike didn't sound like it was on. Um, I mean, this is a this is an interesting problem, both as a technology and as a you know policy issue. Uh, it's something that we definitely have to get out in front of. Uh, it's not exactly at the same speed as say the cyber issue, but I think because it's such a sort of technically sexy problem, a lot of engineers like me love to get out and, and work on a problem like this and see what new things they can create. So as uh, Jay was just saying, this is going to become a platform for any technology you can possibly imagine, people are going to want to put this on something that flies. I mean, people have been trying to fly since the, you know, the, the dawn of time, and so this allows everybody, even children, I mean, these things are being marketed to children on Saturday morning cartoons, and so people are going to want to put new things on this. So it's a problem we need to get out in front of. Uh, as a technologist, it hurts me to say this, but I don't think technology is going to be the solution to most of these problems. It may actually be the creation of more. Uh, but I think we can we can work with the policy people hand in hand to come up with uh, ways to to uh, geofencing is is sort of a term that's being thrown out there for a way to protect this, but sort of taking that concept beyond the idea of just saying you can't fly here and saying technology can't be used to do certain things and reminding the public that there are laws in place. You can't look into your neighbor's window with a camera. You can't do certain things. Just because you physically can doesn't mean you can. And so I think there's a, there's a lot of work that needs to be done kind of across the technology spectrum and the public policy spectrum to educate both the producers of the vehicles and the users. Um, DHS uh, has a, a very interesting and, and sort of a narrow view of what we're doing in the UAV space. We're not trying to compete with the vendors. We're actually looking at what is what, what are the vendor's claims and are they actually able to do the things they say so that we can inform both the law enforcement community and the, uh, the DHS internal users about the, the claims vendors make. One of the things that uh, is of, of great interest to us is what happens when you lose your, your ground link. Uh, their sense and avoid technologies are important when you're out flying around, but what happens when this does go out of the line of sight? You go around a building and you lose your link. So what is this thing going to do? Is it going to crash? Is it going to try to fly back and hit something? So there's a lot of technologies that are out there that we're really interested in understanding the implication of as law enforcement go out and use these things safely, responsibly, as well as the public. But how do we bring these sort of uh, devices into the con op of the average, you know, sort of law enforcement and uh, border surveillance, Coast Guard interdiction environments where you're, you're interacting with the public, but you have these safety concerns as well as privacy concerns that, that are now being presented by the use of UAVs. Um, I think, again, I'd be repeating what a lot of people have said if I went any further, so maybe we'll, uh, we'll end there and open it up to questions. Thanks, Adam. Um, so maybe I'll just start with a few questions and then I'll open it up to the audience. Um, Brian, I wanted to pick up on a uh, quote that you started your remarks with, which is that nothing, there's actually nothing unmanned about unmanned uh, aerial systems. Well, when you think about some of the more innovative and impactful uses of UAS, such as search and rescue or package delivery, for example, um, this, these applications require some level of autonomy. 
that is uh, operation of the UAS uh, flown without being sort of always or continuously controlled by a ground based human operator. And it also requires, um, you know, beyond line of sight UAS flight. Uh, both types of applications are outside of the uh, sort of the FAA's current proposed rules. So what, what is the FAA and what is industry uh, doing there to sort of pave the way for eventual integration of autonomous uh, UAS flight as well as beyond line of sight flight? The, um, yeah, the, the, there is going to be, at some point, there will be autonomous operations. Um, so, you know, the, we sort of have the, you know, pilot optional kind of stuff that's going to go on out there as well. Um, there's also a little bit of a debate going on, and, and it's being uh, played out a little bit in the rulemaking here about one operator being able to control multiple uh, UAS at the same time. So. Um, Ultimately, uh, having a system where you place an order and, you know, the computers know largely what to do with that order and ultimately it, a box rolls down an assembly line and gets picked up by a UAS and delivered to your front door with no human intervention, uh, we're a ways away from that, I, I think it's fair to say. Uh, that's what I call a more complex operation than, than what's currently uh, in this uh, contemplated in, in the notice of proposed rulemaking. So uh, there's, there's a lot of different ways that we can look at this. At the end of the day, uh, I, I think, you know, we're, we're going to start with things that are low risk profile operations, and we're going to collect data. What we've been looking at and, and arguing, and, and this is one of the discussions that's underway uh, in the uh, unmanned aerial systems Advisory Rulemaking Committee, I, the, the UAS ARC, um, and, and I'm just laying that out because that's one of the meetings that truly made my head hurt. You want to get in a room where you hear more acronyms than you can possibly, and I, as a pilot, I tried to keep up, but uh, ultimately they, they swamped me. Um, and it starts with UAS ARC, uh, as if everybody knows what that is. Um, but it's a very important group inside of the, that, that basically is where industry and a lot of different other government agencies are coming together with the FAA to look at and kind of slice and dice all the different pieces that need to be addressed in order to create true integration in the national airspace system of UAS. Uh, and one of the things that we've been arguing is that there are ways of already doing extended, what we call extended visual line of sight um, that might be sort of on let's take agriculture as an application on someone's property. Uh, it might be an aerial survey that's largely being done, it's being, it, it's being loaded into a computer, and then the device has got the software essentially to, to, to do that, uh, that survey w without, you know, and it's going to go over someone's property, because obviously some of our farms are pretty large, uh, but it's going to go beyond someone's visual line of sight. Uh, that, that's an operation, for example, that we think can be conducted safely uh, right now, but is not contemplated in the rule. So we're arguing uh, if we can get it into the rule, create an equivalent level of safety uh, so that we're comfortable with that. And that might be a situation where, you know, you've got circumstances where if the link is lost, you know, the, the, the device is coming, it's going to geostation, it's going to stay where it is, or it's going to come back to its, its point of departure, um, it's going to stay within a general boundary, uh, the geofencing concept, and so forth and so on. I mean, these are all things that we're, we're working on today, uh, and we think the sooner we can fly and get more people in the air, uh, the more data we can collect and the more we can prove that safety. So uh, that's really the approach that's underway right now. Uh, I don't think anybody in our community is saying, let's snap our fingers and just have uh, pizza delivered tomorrow. Uh, all over Washington, D.C. I, I think we understand that, A, this is very complicated airspace. In fact, well, this is not complicated airspace. This is prohibited airspace right here. <laughs> so this is not complicated at all. Uh, you've got to stay out of this airspace unless you're a meteor uh, or Marine One. <clears throat> but in, in many instances, you know, we, we've got to have the ability to create those systems, and, and it's going to take a while, and it's also going to create data. So the argument that we're making is let's figure out low-profile ways of doing this, 
beyond visual line of sight's actually been demonstrated very effectively uh, by ConocoPhillips, uh, and there may be people in the room that know more about this particular uh, instance than I do, but it's, you know, they have been utilizing fairly large size, more than uh, much higher uh, weight categories than the, fi the 55 pound category uh, to do pipeline inspections. Uh, and that was a, a higher endurance aircraft uh, that was basically going up and down a pipeline uh, out in Alaska. So you know, there, that's a good example of a, a way we can test this technology. We can test what happens when, we've, when we C2 fails, when we lose a link and things like that. You know, get more data, increase the, the, the comfort levels, et cetera, um, and, and then move to the next stage. going to uh, to add on to that that that's sort of what I was trying to get at when I was saying need to get out in front of this because as the technology evolves you want to be ready to make rules and regulations based on what capabilities you know that they have and so as vendors are able to demonstrate that it's going to be safe to use that allows the regulators to to make decisions that are informed uh, and again you know a lot of why we've done uh, quite a bit of evaluation of the technology is to is working with the FAA to help them understand, you know, can these be used safely and responsibly within the confines of the rule, and and actually looking at individual systems that vendors brought out to a contained location. I wanted to um, touch on some of the privacy and security related issues here. So. Uh, just about a, a month ago, the Electronic Privacy Information Center, EPIC, filed a lawsuit against the FAA, arguing that the agency should not have avoided uh, proposing privacy protections in its pr proposed rule. Um, and part of the reason why uh, the FAA didn't include that may be that, uh, you know, the, the presidential memorandum uh, directed the NTIA to look into privacy, accountability, transparency issues. But this is this is a really interesting question. I, I would uh, love to hear, uh, Rob, from your perspective, why the FAA rule doesn't address privacy, but it also doesn't address security. So it seems like, you know, every day we hear about new disclosures, uh, about vulnerabilities of, of UAE, UAVs, and that could be potentially ha hacked or exploited. Um, why, why weren't security or privacy contemplated in the rules? Okay, that's a great question. It's not my area of expertise. <laughs> but um, I, I think, you know, the FAA views its, its primary mission, of course, as safety, not privacy, not security. Clearly, those issues are of paramount importance um, as we look at the continued integration of UAS into the NAS, even under the legislation and, and the wording in Section 333, uh, part of what the Secretary of Transportation has to consider as he evaluates these different applications and aircraft uh, for operation under uh, the latitude we have in Section 333, national security is one of the factors that the Secretary needs to consider. Uh, you know, I, I think with where we are with the small rule, we are talking about relatively small aircraft, limited applications, uh, visual line of sight, and I think uh, within that realm, uh, perhaps privacy and security uh, are really not the major focus within there. So I think with the presidential memorandum uh, and putting NTIA as the lead government agency in charge of developing uh, policy. Um, the FAA is prepared along with uh, all the other partner agencies to, to assist the NTIA in, in developing a reasonable approach and uh, you know, whatever framework needs to be put in place to, to address privacy and security. So Jay, I'm interested in, in hearing your perspective on this. So the, the presidential mem memorandum uh, you know, set some some guidance for privacy, for retention of data, uh, requirements for for uh, law enforcement agencies to notify the public about how they use drones, uh, where they use them. Um, in per, in your perspective, is that sufficient? Uh, are your concerns addressed by the the presidential memorandum? Where would you want to see? Uh, some more work done. So, yeah, um, 
the, it was good that the presidential man memorandum was put out, and it was, um, you know, it was, it was, it was good to have it, um, and it was a good start. But no, I don't think we would say that it was adequate. Um, there was a, you know, I think that the. Um, it, it, the, the restrictions on the use of drones are, are very, very broad. It basically just says an authorized purpose. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, we, and we would like to see law enforcement only using drones when they have a warrant or otherwise very, very strong reason to believe that it would collect, collect evidence of wrongdoing. Um, we, uh, you know, and a lot of the memorandum was sort of basically exhorting the agencies to follow the law that already exists, you know, follow the Constitution. Um, I don't think a presidential memorandum should be necessary for uh, agencies to follow the Constitution or other existing law, but it's good, that, it's good to, push, to push agencies and to require them to set up procedures and so forth, which is what the memorandum did. Um, you know, it, had a, it has pretty loose retention policies. I mean, I guess it was good to have policies in all those areas, including um, transparency but none of them were, are so tight that an agency that wanted to get around them couldn't pretty easily do so, I guess. Um, so um, so that's, that's sort of our, our view of the thing. And, and certainly the multi-stakeholder process, um, uh, we're, we, we plan on participating in that and, and uh, look forward to that. What, what about um, the sort of um, legal environment at the state level. So we've seen several states establish uh, privacy and safety related uh, uh, laws with regard to uh, domestic drone use. Um, I'm curious to hear from sort of the industry perspective um, as well as, as yours, Jay, whether, um, you know, what, whether you think some of these state laws may be going too far uh, and may have the potential to stifle innovation in uh, this area before we can sort of realize and understand um, the, the types of applications uh, that, that this technology would enable. Um, and, you know, when you look at the state level, uh, legis the legislative proposals as well as those that have been enacted, um, are there ones that you think could potentially serve as a model? Um. I don't think that there's any one state that's perfect that I would hold out as a model. Some of them are certainly better than others. Um, it's been really an unprecedented outpouring of ac action in the last two sessions by by the states. Um, you know, we set up a page to track all the legislation, and uh, it was just really incredible. Um, as somebody who's been working on privacy for like 15 years, to see this outpouring of action on this one privacy issue, um, and I, I'm not quite sure why it is. I think that perhaps a lot of privacy issues like you know, big data or what have you are very abstract, and drones, it doesn't take much imagination to understand why a flying robot with a camera hovering over your backyard is an invasion of privacy. And also I think that there's been a real left-right coalition on it. I think all the state bills have either been um, uh, jointly sponsored by Democrats and Republicans or just sponsored by Republicans. Um, and the, uh, and so there has been this outpouring, and inevitably, some of the state bills are better than others. Some of them are bad, like Texas's, which pretty much bans all private photography, um, and we opposed it. Um, some of them are, are just sort of sloppy, um, but, but, uh, but some of them are better and, and impose um, warrant requirements uh, for law enforcement use, which, you know, which, which we think is a good thing. Um, and it's possible that, that even some of the good ones that we like may prove to be um, a little bit too restrictive and that, that there needs to be some exceptions. For example, it's been pointed out to us that, you know, a warrant requirement may prohibit police from taking photographs of accident scenes, like traffic accident scenes, you know, a use of drones that we would have no problem with whatsoever. Um, but in a world where we're always seeing technology rushing out um, and being deployed with, with no democratic debate whatsoever, it's refreshing that, be, that thanks to the FAA and its, um, its deliberate pace in, 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 in its careful pace, whatever word you want to use, we have no dog in the, in, in the, in the fight over uh, the safety uh, questions. Um, uh, but it create, for one way or another, the FAA has created a space for there to be a democratic debate over this technology. And, um, and it, it's not so bad if for once the privacy concern, the, the privacy restrictions are maybe a little too tight and need to be walked back a little bit rather than trying to um, deal with facts on the ground where you already have a technology widely deployed and, and trying to play catch up and, and put in place some privacy um, concerns after the fact as we are with, for example, automatic license plate readers which are being spread all over the country and collecting information about people's whereabouts. Um, so, um, so yeah, I'll leave it there for now.
Well, I, I agree with Jay. It's pretty variable out there. Um, we're, we're, we're tracking all those state things as well. A lot of our chapters are, are directly engaged in, in, uh, in a lot of battles at the state level. And, um, and it's interesting. I mean, we're, we're in favor of privacy. Uh, AUVSI has worked with the ACLU in, in the past and would, would be delighted to work in the future. Um, but fundamentally, I, I, even though it's easy perception, it, it, to get that perception or image in your mind of, of a drone sitting over your backyard, um, I think the likelihood of that you know, is, is questionable. And, and the, really what we're uh, right, right now, I think that what concerns me is that, is that the variability of what's going on at the state level is more a function of a lack of education. Um, so the, the key will be to find that balance. Um, and, and we're looking to find that balance with multiple stakeholders. Um, we're all in favor of privacy. I, I think it's, it's uh, uh, it, it is fascinating to me that, that some of the, the larger data issues, at the end of the day, it really is about, uh, it, it's about the collection of data, the retention of data, how that data is being protected, uh, how it's being stored, et cetera. Uh, this is one more platform for, for collecting data. But you know, how many people know that when you walk through Miami Airport, th there are devices everywhere in Miami Airport that are assigning something to your cell phone and keeping track of where you go? It's not specifically to you. Is that a privacy invasion or not? Uh, I'm not a privacy expert, but it makes me uncomfortable. So I, I, I'm very sympathetic uh, to this concern. Um, but it, it extends well beyond, and I think it's very interesting that, that you know, part of our challenge is to make certain that, uh, that this technology, that whatever solutions we come up with, that, th that we come up with, that they, they need to be appropriate uh, and, and not technology specific, uh, unless the, it, there's some very specific reason why this technology needs to be uh, treated differently than anything else that flies, for example. Maybe we can take some questions from the audience uh, in the front here. Um, do we have a microphone? Sorry. Oh, she's coming. Hold on just one sec. Thank you. And please, please introduce yourself. Thank you so much uh, for, to all panelists. Uh, I'm Akbar Khwaja, former World Bank official. Uh, you have mentioned uh, uh, security, surveillance, and safety. And my question is to FAA, Robert, uh, that if you could comment on a little bit global regulatory uh, impact, uh, if, if I know you're still in proposal mode within states, but are you working with any international regulatory authorities also? And also, I know the Chinese are already manufacturing and they're supplying all over. Uh, is there any protocol that restricts the manufacturing concerns also? Thank you. Uh, the UAS Integration Office at the FAA is working globally. Um, we're working through ICAO. We are working uh, through an organization uh, called JARIS in uh, Europe. So we're very much working towards harmonization of standards, evolving regulations, uh, approaches, frameworks. So the answer there is yes. Um, Relative to working with manufacturers, uh, regardless of where they are, um, obviously they're uh, within the NPRM, uh, there are no particular airworthiness standards. Uh, so we haven't crossed that threshold from a regulatory standpoint yet. But one can contemplate uh, moving in, into the future of more complex operations that allow a greater variety of uh, applications to take place. Uh, vehicles with different characteristics, and including endurance, uh, will start to evolve and we will have to develop appropriate standards and regulations to permit those operations. So, um, you know, at that time, uh, I would contemplate that we'd be moving closer towards, uh, you know, starting to certify when certain thresholds are, are reached uh, within an aircraft, and of course, regardless of where that aircraft is is manufactured and, and uh, designed, uh, there'll have to be some some compliance with with those standards and regs. Any timeline? Any timeline? No, I don't have a timeline for you. <laughs> uh, 
I'm Charlie Leoka. I'm with uh, uh, Travelers United. We're an, an advocacy group for consumers. And Brian's going to get tired of my questions. <laughs> every, uh, every panel, he's sitting there and I'm standing here. But one of the things which kind of disturbs me about this is that we're, uh, we're focusing on the NPRM. And there's another big, big thing going on right now, and it's called the FAA Reauthorization Bill. And that is a bill which will um, set the visionary um, table for uh, UASs in the future. And um, the FAA is, you know, doing a, a job right now with, you know, where, with the NPRM, which they've come out with. But as we look at this thing into the future, we're we have to look out 10, 20, 30 years. We've got to look at uh, the FAA is going to probably not be the main uh, player in this. Um, the airspace will probably be bifurcated. There'll be what's now Class G airspace will be controlled in a different way. Uh, these are the kinds of things that NASA is looking at and so on. And, and I just think I, I'd kind of like to get this panel to think about more of a visionary look of where we see things going. Um, right now I'm on the Hill and I'm talking to people in the, um, on the, in the Commerce Committee and the House Transportation Committee. You know, let's look to the future. When I walk in, they look at me like I've got two heads. But these young kids get it. All of a sudden, there's an aha moment, and then they stop. And already I've heard from other uh, government affairs people who come in and they go, wow, they were asking me about what's going to happen in 10, 20, 30 years. And it's something which I think we need to focus on, and everyone in this room is obviously involved in this um, discussion. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. So as we look forward, I just hope that some of the answers take a look beyond the NPRM, which I really think is part of our problem right now. We're kind of looking at today, and we're looking at last couple of months and maybe a couple of months into the future, where we've got to start laying the table for the f big future. And that's what I was kind of hoping to hear when I came here. I, I think that's a great comment. Obviously, we're, we're also in, in very deeply engaged in this conversation over FAA reauthorization. Um, it's a very tactical discussion, and, you know, the, everything, uh, you know, I, I met with Paul Rinaldi last week, and he said, how are you guys going to pay to use the airspace, um, which was a really legitimate question that I didn't have an answer to yet. But, you know, but we, we, we've kind of got the, a, a number of things going on here, and the one constant that's involved is rapid advancement of technology. Um, so the, the, there's a lot of discussion about regulations because the regulations have not arguably not been keeping up with this this advancement of technology, um, and, and I, I think part of what delayed the NPRM coming out was a realization that inside of the FAA, as, if, as I understand it, that you know that the the old way of thinking about this just wasn't going to work, and, and they went back to what we're calling a, a technology neutral risk based approach, uh, and, and and that's the result that we're dealing with, and, and we're basically looking at that and saying good start. You know, now, now let's think about how, how do we enable some of these more complex operations? How do we develop that equivalent level of safety? Because in the aviation system, we have an extremely high level of, of safety. You know, Rob could tell us exactly what that number is. It's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's you know, numbers 9.99999. It's, it's a very impressive safety record. And we want to, we want to actually add to that safety record. Um, the, one of the things that we've been discussing with the reauthorization in the reauthorization process uh, is precisely the way you mentioned NASA. There's a there's a fascinating conversation that's been underway uh, at NASA how to develop an air traffic control system for UAS. Um, let's talk about the airspace that's rarely used but below 400 feet. Most aircraft that are at 400 feet or below are landing or taking off. There are exceptions to that, obviously, but for the most part, this is this is not. It's not well utilized airspace, and 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 the question is how can we utilize it better, safely, uh, and 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 there are a lot of really smart people at NASA talking about that, but the big question is how does that relate to the people that have learned a great deal uh, at DoD of how to make it safe to integrate how how to safely integrate manned and unmanned systems, which they've been doing in theater uh, for over 10 years successfully. Uh, there have been some you know, expensive noises in the process, but, uh, but they've, they've learned how to do that. How do we integrate those technologies and in some of the, the ongoing research that's being done 
in that particular arena. Um, for, I look at it from the standpoint of the industry is bringing those technology solutions uh, to the government. We, we, want, we want to not only utilize the airspace, uh, it's incumbent upon industry uh, to actually figure out how to do this and to do it economically. Uh, and there, I think, you know, w vision is not going to be a problem. You have organizations like Amazon. Of course, Jeff Bezos has a particular vision of this. You have people like Dave Voss at, at Google um, that are extremely, extremely well versed in, in this technology and how to, how to literally transform the airspace into the, into the future. Um, and, and I can't resist the urge to, you know, to just remind us all about the joke that we have to continue to endure um, every time Boeing brings out a new aircraft, which is what, you know, who gets to fly the aircraft, and the answer is the United test pilot and a German Shepherd. The test pilot's job is to feed the dog, and the dog's job is to bite the pilot if he tries to touch the aircraft. Um, you know, th this is, this, we've been hearing this joke for a while now. I think it started with the 737 late versions, you know, and it's, it's been ongoing. So uh, the, the truth of the matter is that, that we can do a lot uh, and it's not just the things that fly in the air. If you look at large seagoing vessels, um, in many instances, there's, you know, someone's on the bridge, but they're not necessarily, you know, at the wheel you know, like they were in the old British Navy. So, um, you know, th there's, there's a lot of technology that's coming into play. The advancement of that technology is going to be the biggest challenge. Um, and, and if it's tough for the regulators, it's probably even harder for the people trying to figure out what to do with the money going forward. But we're engaged in that conversation. Hi, uh, Vadim Allen, uh, Voice of America News. Uh, I'd like to check, um, I'm not sure who, who should ask this question, but um, uh, we all know this uh, military type drone, uh, like Predator, for uh, uh, doing the airstrikes. And we know this small recreational helicopter type with the uh, four propellers, horizontal. Uh, is there anything in between? And uh, if there is, how is it used? And uh, if it, there isn't, is it coming soon? Thank you. Yeah, there are lots of stuff in between. I, I, it's, it's fascinating. I was at, uh, at a, in an organization's um, crib last two weeks ago in, in San Francisco that provides autopilots and middleware for enterprise systems. They had devices from all over the world. Some of them were fixed wing, some of them were rotor. Uh, and they, and w the most fascinating one, they had actually built on a, on a 3D printer in about two days uh, themselves. So um, there, there are... Uh, there are going to be as many devices here as you can imagine a mission for uh, going forward. And that's one of the reasons why we think uh, it's extremely important uh, to, to take kind of a performance-based approach here. What, what do we need to be doing uh, in the profile of operation? What level of safety do we need to achieve uh, in, in order for us to go ahead and operate? Uh, it, it, if it's connected to the device itself, uh, that's going to be a challenge. Uh, if if it's you know now if it's something that's that's flying 18,000 feet and above Class A airspace, um, you know that's probably a little bit different. That's a larger aircraft, and that's probably going to be you know need a, an airworthiness certificate, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but there's all kinds of things that are that are out there that you can launch from boats and so forth and so on. Um, that that's really it's it's a very robust. Thing, and we've got a database capturing all of these systems, and it's very, very difficult to keep up to date. I, I just wanted to follow up a little bit um, to Brian's comments. Um, so one of the exciting things for me working on Section 333 is I, I'm getting to see new things every day. It's remarkable, um, you know, what is being proposed to the FAA. Um, so literally every day, it's aircraft with different power sources, uh, aircraft operating in new and novel ways. Um, and I think, you know, the technology in this rapid pace of technology growth, technology introduction, uh, and this very rapid uh, decline in the cost of technology, so it's, it's very accessible, um, is both an opportunity for us economically um, but it's a real challenge uh, for a regulatory agency, and this is not unique to aviation. It's, it's across the board, any kind of technology area. So, um, you know, I, I just think 
the government, regulatory agencies in, in general are really struggling with, you know, how do we adapt to this new era where technology is advancing so quickly and providing a reasonable basis to get this technology out uh, where it needs to be. Thanks, uh, Dana Goward with the RNT Foundation. Uh, the FCC and FBI have said that GPS disruption is getting to be more and more of a problem. Could you all comment, uh, especially Adam and, and Brian, on uh, what DOT is looking at in terms of a complementary system to add to uh, the, the navigation signals available? Well, I'm, not, I'm actually not familiar with what DOT is doing, um, but that is a, a huge area of concern. I mean, GPS is... Uh, We've become very reliant on GPS even just as, as drivers around the city. And so as you look at things like uh, the, the sense and avoid issue uh, for, for small vehicles and the, um, the other issue of the ground link loss, uh, the, the GPS signal becomes very important. Um, I think this is an area where there, there are some areas where the government uh, shouldn't get in the mix because you're competing with industry. I think this is one of those areas where the government is probably going to have to take uh, a leading role in because it's the, uh, the sort of the tragedy of the commons, the, the, the good of the people. Um, one of the issues that I don't think we've under, we understand yet now and, and is a question we need to start asking ourselves is sort of to what end do we need to do some of these things? So sense and avoid is a very broad and general topic. What are we looking for that sense and avoid to do? Is it strictly for collisions with other vehicles while in the air? Is it to avoid airspace? Is it to avoid uh, violating a privacy act? So I think there's some questions we need to answer before we can start to pursue the technology as to what are we actually trying to accomplish so that we can start to understand the technology needed to accomplish it. Yeah, I, I really didn't have a great, I, I, don't, I don't have a, a specific answer on GPS. What I, what I can tell you is that, um, is that there, I think GPS is always going to be uh, one of the foundational technologies, uh, no question about that, and that system is important for a whole variety of reasons. So I, I think it goes well beyond UAS. What, what I can say is there are some really interesting ideas that are coming into the mix um, a, a, about how to utilize some of the infrastructure that's out there already. Uh, and to navigate around that, and, and some of it could be ground-based navigation as well. So um, I don't know if that's going to be driven by uh, an overload of the system or a degradation of the system or some of the other challenges, or, but we will need, you know, we'll need redundancy in, in the technologies, and I think there are some very interesting things that are being looked at, and be happy to talk to you about that. Hi, Jesse Stepler with Measure. Um, as a commercial operator, one of the things that we've seen is a big challenge, and going back to the previous question about, you know, a predator versus a quadcopter, uh, is that, you know, there are a lot of, I think, uh, misconceptions in, in this space. Uh, you know, it's an all or nothing thing. Either you're firing a Hellfire or you're delivering packages for Amazon. Either you're flying visual line of sight or you're, you know, operating in Class A airspace. So with that in mind, I guess my question for both Brian and Robert is to what extent is uh, the FAA working on interim uh, steps, not the big picture stuff we were discussing 20 or 30 years down the line, but say Class G airspace that's out in the middle of nowhere, not just a farmer per se, but you know something that it doesn't even have a regional airport nearby. Are we starting co to consider beyond visual line of sight operations in areas where there is no manned aircraft uh, you know, traffic currently? Yeah, so right, right now in the 333, we are considering uh, a number of technologies that would, uh, as currently proposed in the NPRM, that would go beyond uh, what would be uh, uh, possible under, under that rule. Um, night operations, for example, we, we have at least one petition that's proposing night operations. So I, I think from, from the viewpoint uh, of trying to expand the envelope into other areas. Um, you know, Section 333 is limited to visual line of sight, but, you know, we have an exemption process that's always been there, that's always been available to, uh, you know, review uh, particular cases, uh, limited cases, of course, uh, but to review 
uh, a petition by anyone to, to, to go a little bit further and to look at some potential relief to regulations. So um, that's what we're doing in our program. Uh, you know, as we get requests, petitions for exemption, uh, you know, clearly it's all about safety. It's providing equivalent level of safety or no adverse impact to safety. But I, I think as we continue to look at petitions for exemption, we'll continue to look at new and novel uh, applications, uh, uh, especially on a limited basis. I, you know, I, I think that there is an opportunity for both well, really for working with the industry and learning some things from some of these limited operations. So, uh, but of course, we have a very complex airspace system, you know, getting, getting back to the previous questions. Uh, there are a lot of users in that system. Uh, there's a very high degree of safety in that system. So, you know, safety comes first, but as we can start to explore other approaches, uh, I, I think there are tools available uh, that we've been applying already that we will continue to apply. Yeah, and the, the principle that we're using is risk-based technology neutral. So it, it you know, that's, that's sort of a catch-all phrase that we're now using for, there's gonna be a lot of different platforms, let's not be specific about it. I, you know, we, we've gone forward, we're moving forward with this initial rule, which is anything under 55 pounds, um, and, and then sort of using the, the tools that we generally have, line of sight, types of daytime operations away from people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we're, we're trying to unlock a, a lot of the things that, that you know, we know people want to do with the technology now, but that's, that's not the same as you know, a, a FedEx truck using something to do the last mile, which might be 20 miles uh, down a driveway in North Dakota uh, to deliver a package. Uh, and literally, this is a concept that, that it's being discussed openly, I mean, in, in Class G airspace versus Amazon delivering something in downtown Washington. Those, those are two very, very different things. And you could have the same device involved, same mission, um, but it's, it's, you know, it's a very, very different kind of uh, profile of operation. So uh, I took a, a great deal of comfort from the administrator's words when he announced the rule uh, on February 15th. He said, we're trying to create the most flexible uh, airspace, UAS airspace system in the world. And, and Robert used the words equivalent to that, uh, and I, I checked it with the administrator two weeks ago, or less than two weeks ago, uh, when I saw him face to face. And that's the objective. So flexibility, we think flexibility in that system is important. Uh, some of the principles will always always apply. You know, no harm, equivalent level of safety, et cetera, et cetera. We've got to be able, and, that, and the reason why we call it UAS is because that's what the FAA calls it. Uh, so you know, that's we we have to deal with the regulator. Right, and and that's a it's it's we would argue that regulations are a good thing here. We don't want things falling out of the sky, and we have a hundred percent track record. We've never left one up there yet. Good morning, Lori Watkins from the Truman Project. I have a question. Um, as a person who works within this industry and supports the education and PR campaign. Um, and in an effort to piggyback off the gentleman's um, topic of looking towards the future, I have a question. I thought up until two weeks ago that it would be questionable, as Brian said, um, that a gyrocopter would fly and land within restricted airspace on the line on the lawn of the Capitol, but that did happen, along with an unmanned platform a few months earlier on the lawn of the White House. In ensuring that the U.S. airspace remains the safest in the world, how can the public rest assured that the airspace is safe when there have been two incidents that took place in an area that is supposed to be one of the most safest and restricted in the world, the National Capital Region, um, and which one was manned and which was one was unmanned? Because um, Just because everyone keeps talking about all this technology that we have that's supposed to prevent these things. So if that could happen here, just from a PR perspective, how can the public rest assured that if that's happening in some place that's super safe, how, how can it not happen to where they live? Thank you. This is not a core ACLU thing, but I'll make an observation, which is I think the security risks of, uh, of, of drones are, are very real. Um, and, but historically in the United States, we've tolerated a, a large amount of risk when there's huge economic benefits to be made. I mean, the, the, the safety record of trains, when the train industry, train technology was new, was terrible. There were accidents, there were horrible accidents regularly. 
um, and we tolerated it because of the economic benefits. Um, we tolerate a huge amount, 30,000 a year car deaths in our country. Um, so there are some things we'll tolerate. There are other things we have zero tolerance for. We pretty much have zero tolerance for, for commercial airline uh, accidents. Um, and we have zero tolerance for terrorism. Um, and so I think, and, and we also have giant security agencies that are very, very powerful in this um, government and in this society. And I think that we're going to see a huge clash between, and this is sort of, I'm sort of a little bit outside this because this is not a core ACLU issue, but I mean, we're going to see a huge clash between industry and, and the economic potential benefits of this and the security interests here. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what happens. And I think that, you know, this is an industry that's in the fetal stage of development. And so small things that happen at this stage can have lifetime effects f for many, many decades. And so uh, I think a lot of how this industry will go, I would predict, will depend on whether, what exact types of incidents we see. If we see um, somebody put a gun on a drone and, and remotely start shooting people as a terrorist attack, then you know, that, that may steer things. And, and it will matter if that person is a white person or a, an Arab or Muslim um, in how what framing is used to define that as a terrorist attack or yet another sort of shooting. Um, and so um, you know, I think that incidents and accidents in the next couple years could be very, very critical in shaping the direction of which uh, uh, this technology might go. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I think also, you know, as, as I said before, excuse me, <clears throat> We are experiencing a proliferation of this technology. It's very available, um, it's very cheap, and really anybody is out there buying it and using it. And I think the vast, vast majority of persons that are buying and using this technology are, are doing with the very best of intentions. Uh, they want to experience something that's enjoyable and rewarding and are not creating a particular security hazard. Um, like with any technology, there are bad actors, there will always be the potential to put a good technology towards an ill purpose. Um, I think one of the things that the FAA is doing along with, uh, you know, partners in the industries like AUVSI and uh, Small UAS Coalition and others is education and outreach, uh, really trying to reach the, the greatest number of people. We've got a number of campaigns going on to to reach out and educate them on the do's and don'ts, what's safe, what's not safe. Uh, so that's a big part. Uh, I think another thing is uh, providing timely service, and, and I'll talk you know, in terms of timely authorization. So one of the things we're trying to do with 333 is we are uh, stepping up our efforts to really provide a timely uh, response back to petitioners. And what we feel is that by enabling the good actors, by, you know, the ones who are coming to the FAA and, and seeking uh, legal authorization to operate, the more that we can do with that, the more we, we help squeeze out perhaps some of the folks that are uh, uh, operating illegally. Uh, but trying to put that genie in the bottle and, and put the stopper in it is, is, is a Herculean uh, task. I'm not really sure how we can do that completely. And, and just to, to sort of add in on that, there are a lot of efforts across government right now looking at the security and safety aspects. Can't really go into the specifics of it, but we, we, are, we are seeing a lot more work being done over the last year or so looking at, you know, how do we keep these things, again, the, the safe and responsible use, uh, quote, how do we bring technology to bear on that problem? Uh, it's, it's a hard one, but, but we're looking at it. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Yeah, good morning, Lieutenant Colonel Grasso from Embassy of Italy. And uh, before coming here to DC, I was uh, an uh, UIS Awarding Certification Manager at Italian Awarding Authorities. And as you probably know, we have been used drones uh, like, many, like many nations since many, many years, since 2000. And we had the need to consolidate, to prepare a very good uh, regula regulatory framework uh, to fly safely in country and uh, also in theater. Uh, uh, our uh, drones, and um, not only to prepare a, a good regulatory framework, but also to harmonize within Na NATO, NATO, for example, NATO countries. And in this um, field, we prepare very, very good standards in, in the working group that we have in NATO, standards that are available on the table since many, many years. One of these, uh, I was the lead of this panel for unmanned aircraft uh, with maximum takeoff weight and, uh, under 150 kilos. So, when we offer these in Europe uh, to our international community in Europe, 
the, we had the very poor feedback because we offered them, say, this is something that is on the table, please use it because it's making a lot of experience, uh, comes from a lot of experience. So my question to you is, uh, what is uh, your feeling about uh, military civil cooperation in the field of awarding certification here in the US? Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, um, yeah I'll take a stab at that. So um, I don't know the details of uh, you know, what's going on relative to uh, you know, within ICAO or in Europe and other places relative to the development of, of standards and, and regulations. Um, I, you know, I'm sure that those groups are, are reviewing everything that's available from various countries, from NATO, from other organizations, and you know, we'll use that to the greatest extent possible. Um, I would suspect that um, uh, some of the challenges with uh, regards to civil airspace, uh, both here in the U.S. and in Europe and, and elsewhere throughout the world, that there are different challenges uh, relative to that where, you know, perhaps some of these, these other types of standards uh, that you're mentioning, uh, you know, cannot ad adequately uh, fit in with or, or address. So uh, it's not an area of expertise, but uh, that's what I would suspect. I'm just aware of the fact that there are conversations increasingly going on um, that have started on the military side uh, of this community uh, that, that are now, we're, we're finding those best practices. A good example is the whole discussion about detect and avoid. If you can't see something, you've got to detect it. And, and then the question becomes, you know, how much do I need to miss by? Right? So, so well clear standards, for example. You know, that, that's a discussion that started on the military side, that's been implemented on the military side in theater. Now, now it's being brought back and it's, it's, being, it's being looked at in the context of a UIS uh, traffic management system uh, that's essentially, NASA's in the lead on that right now. Uh, but FAA is also uh, look at, beginning to get into that conversation a little bit. Um, so I, th I, think, I think there was a, a real gulf between these, you know, the commercial side and the military side, and a lot of folks on the commercial side didn't want anything to do with the military side. I think that's starting to break down now. We didn't want to use the word drone, right? That drone, that was a bad word that was connected to the military, et cetera, et cetera. I think we're, we're you know, we're getting over those things now and recognizing that, um, that, that, that many technologies start on the military side, work their way into ubiquity uh, via commercial applications, et cetera, and I think that's probably what's going to happen here. And if I needed any more evidence of that, um, I, I took an out brief from a very smart group of people, not just uh, military people, there were some civilians, but the military people from all the branches who for a year had looked at how to begin standardizing uh, the, their use of UAS and unmanned systems in general, because each of the branches had in many instances taken different approaches to this. Um, and ultimately they decided that the smartest thing that they could do was be fast followers of the commercial sector. That was their conclusion, um, and 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 the other interesting conclusion that I'm happy to share was that uh, obviously in a very very fiscally constrained environment going forward in the military, they're looking for where the pots of money are that they can actually utilize to deploy this uh, in in more applications, and and what they came up with was logistics. So you, you begin to see how those two worlds come together. Uh, and ultimately, standards are, are going to be adopted that I, I think benefit from experts, whether they you know, currently work for the DOD or one of the branches or they, they've left the military and they're working for Lockheed Martin or, or Google. Uh, they're the same people. I'd, I'd like to also say, I'd like to get your contact info because uh, I, I know my response was hardly adequate. Um, because we do have several people in the office that this is what they do, and I'd like to, you know, get feedback back to you. Test one. My name is Renee Marsh. I'm with CNN. And um, this question is for Rob, Brian, and Adam as well, if you weigh in. Um, going back to the issue of security as it relates to drones, I know, Rob, you mentioned, you know, educating the good actors so that they know what is allowed and what isn't allowed. But uh, just from a security standpoint, I just wonder, does the FAA have a proposal or 
plan or solution in place to deal with perhaps bad actors who may want to fly a drone into restricted airspace? Uh, and if not, which agency is in charge or leading the charge for this national security concern of uh, bad actors who may be flying where they're not supposed to? I know you mentioned there are several agencies working on this, but who exactly is leading the charge? So relative to the area of surveillance and uh, over operations in the NAS, um, we have procedures in place. We provide surveillance of the NAS today, of operators in the NAS in many, many different ways. Uh, we use the risk-based approach to surveillance, so uh, our focal areas uh, change. Um, first and foremost, we are pursuing education. Uh, and when we find uh, cases where there has been some type of uh, violation of a reg, somebody has operated improperly, uh, the first step is not to jump towards enforcement and enforcement action, but the first step is to send a letter, to reach out, to get the dialogue going. Um, however, if there is uh, you know, a continued violation, uh, we will use the enforcement mechanisms that we have today to take action. Uh, I think we've taken action in about, uh, I think the number is about seven cases uh, for various reasons uh, against uh, operators. So um, that's the, the approach that we will continue to take. On the technology side, um no one has sort of taken the lead, uh, partly because we all have varying needs, uh, kind of back to the, the comment of, you know, what are we trying to solve? So if, 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 you're, if you're DOD, you have concern about your bases. If you're the Secret Service or the Capitol Police, you have concern about the facilities and the grounds that you protect. And so the, the technology being developed across the board, we're looking at where there are similar needs and, and similar concerns and how do we address the particular security uh, and safety issues associated with each of those areas. So the, the work's being done uh, jointly in some cases, coordinated in most uh, of the rest. And <clears throat> so I, again, I, it's, it's something I can't really talk too much about, but, but the, the issue uh, really does depend on the agency who has responsibility for that airspace or those grounds um, as to what they're trying to do. So it's, it's a joint, um, interagency program. I, I think the most thing, important thing that we're contributing to this conversation is that, is that the industry is, is working toward regulations with the FAA. We want to be a regulated industry. Uh, the people that I represent are, are going to be, they're going to be certificated people that are operating under regulations that are insured, et cetera, et cetera. And, and uh, as an aviator myself, you know, we, we use this concept of, 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 a, of an, a, a culture of compliance, right? There, there's, there's nothing more horrific to me than seeing somebody flying down the mall in a gyrocopter. Uh, that, that's just, it's, it's a really abhorrent thing to see uh, that someone uh, who's learned these skills and knows what they're doing is intentionally violating. Now, that was obviously an act of protest. Misuse is misuse, um, whether it's somebody, you know, who's had a little bit too much to drink at 3 o'clock in the morning trying to impress their girlfriend and ends up on the president's lawn, or real malintent. Um, I can tell you that, that we, we collaborate with the Department of Homeland Security, uh, and generally speaking, two people show up in my office. One is the person that's responsible for how to utilize the technology going forward, and the other is the person who is trying to deal with the security challenge. Um, that, that we're all concerned about. And, you know, all we can do is, is, uh, is cultivate an environment and a community that has, is compliance-oriented uh, and have regulations that actually define safe and responsible use, and we're doing that. Well, I think we could stay here for another hour and a half to talk uh, more about these issues. I know there are a lot of questions in the room, um, but our speakers have been more than generous with their time. Uh, this has been a truly uh, enlightening and uh, interesting discussion, and I look forward to continuing to work with you guys uh, through CSIS here. Um, and uh, if you can stay a little bit longer to chat with folks in the room, we would welcome you to do that. Thank you. Thank you.